I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, Finance Committee um, meeting for uh, the 25th of April, 2013. And this is not just a Finance Committee meeting, but also we have um, members and I think a quorum from many other boards and committees, including the Select Board, School Committee, the Regional School Committee, the Library Trustees. And um, if there are quorums of those meetings present, I want to note for the record that uh, we have, all of those have been posted as meetings since it is um, a discussion of um, matters that might come up for debate before other boards and committees at a later time. So um, these have all been publicly posted meetings. I would also like to recognize that we have John Tricky, who's chair of the Pelham uh, Finance Committee present. And um, the reason that uh, John is here is that um, the, act, the, the same um, actuary who did the study for Amherst and the Amherst Pelham Regional School District also did a report for the town of Pelham. And um, so that this is really an opportunity for um, our speaker to uh, talk to us for a few minutes about um, OPEB and the work that he did and his report recommendations. And, uh, but mostly what we're going to do is, after that is um, open it up for questions. Um, this is being broadcast by Amherst Media. Uh, and uh, so I do need to ask people if you're asking questions to please use microphones. Um, it's not just for the room, but um, for uh, the ability of Amherst Media to pick it up. So with that, I would uh, like to just immediately um, introduce our speaker, uh, Larry Stone, um, and uh, his consulting firm um, has uh, completed the reports that have been sent to the various uh, groupings that I've previously named. And um, with, uh, and so I'll turn it over to you, Larry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my goal here is to mainly really answer questions of that anybody has uh, for those. But I thought that maybe it would a little introduction to uh, the world of other post-employment benefits would be uh, worthwhile. Uh, a number of years ago, GASB, which is a board which uh, controls uh, governmental accounting, um, issued GASB statements 43 and 45, and they deal with how these type of benefits are reflected on the financial statements of uh, cities and towns and other public entities. Um, when they talk about other post-employment benefits, they're talking about the other is really referring to other than retirement. So this is really mainly medical insurance is really the main one. But there are the possibility of others. You, know, you can surely have some places have dental. There's often a basic life insurance policy too for retirees, often a fairly small benefit. But mainly the medical, but you could have others. You could have uh, vision, you could have post uh, prepaid legal, you know, there's any number of things that might be provided to retirees uh, which would create a liability in the town. The concern was that you have this big liability and you weren't being, it wasn't really being reflected on your books. If you compared the financial statement of one town to another one, one provided health insurance to their retirees and the other one didn't, they would actually look very similar. So there wasn't a reflection of this large, liabil large deferred liability. So and that's really the goal of, of the, these statements, was to start reflecting these accrued benefits. And this has been a whole procedure throughout GASB for all sorts of other uh, accounting and public to basically make this more transparent and reflect the actual long-term liabilities. So there are a couple of challenges in terms of valuing these type of benefits. One is uh, you don't really know what, you're, the main, probably the, probably the biggest one is that you really don't know how medical costs are gonna change. So these numbers are really in a sense soft in that 
you, it's really hard to project from one year to the next whether medical insurance, med, medical costs are going to go up 0% or they're going to go up 20. You've experienced all, both of those. And even sometimes pieces of it go down. So it's very, very difficult. And so we don't pretend to say that this is a prediction. It's not a prediction. It's really just a reasonable representation of what could happen in the future. We don't really have any expectation that this will actually occur the way we say it will. As a matter of fact, it can't, because we make assumptions, things like where a piece of a person dies in a year. That usually doesn't happen. <laughs> so. You can't really get it, but what we're trying to do is create what really looks like a budget, which sort of says, okay, if you were trying to systematically reflect this type of cost, then how would you do it? So there's two pieces for it. There's the current retirees, and then there's the active employees. Now, I like to think of the active employees as future retirees. This is to distinguish from the fact that they're, when they're active employees, they're getting health insurance. We're not valuing that, health, that cost. We're just valuing their cost when they're post-employment, so after they retire. So that's why I like to refer to them as future retirees. But you can understand that the difference between um, somebody who's, like, at, who's 30 years old, then they're going to retire, let's say, at age 65, and they're going to start receiving this benefit until they're um, maybe even 100 years old, is very hard to predict, particularly when there's a difference, let's say we were just talking about, between 0% increases a year and 20% increases a year. And think about that compounding over an 80-year period of time. The numbers are wildly different. So that's sort of a caveat, but so you understand what this is. These aren't, this isn't saying, like, this is the liability. This is a reasonable representation of the liability. Okay, now, how does GASB want you to reflect this? Basically, you create something called an ARC, the Annual Required Contribution. And what that is is composed of two pieces. One is it's the amount that your people are earning to every year. So now if you have somebody, and let's a somewhat simplified example, you have a 30-year uh, person who's going to have a 30-year career, it's one thirtieth of the benefit. That's the value, and that's what we would call it a normal cost, a service cost. And so if you paid that every year, and then everything happened just the way we thought it, it would, that would accumulate with earnings and would be, you'd have exactly the amount of money if you started from day one on that and everything worked out exactly the way we said, you know, that little piece of that person died, so of course it can't happen, but if it did, then you would have exactly the right amount to pay for that benefit when they retire because you're paying that each year. Now the other piece is the accrued liability. That's where the retirees come in too. That's based on all service that has happened already. Well for a retiree all their service has already happened. So they're fully in the accrued liability. There's no service costs, normal costs for them because they're not earning more service. It's just, just that, you know, they're just the, in the accrued liability. So how many people have I lost so far? No, because this is, uh, if you haven't heard these concepts, it can be very uh, painful and difficult to, to work on. But now let's also take a look at that same person who had that 30-year career, is going to have this 30-year career. And let's say they've worked 20 years of it already. So their accrued liability is 20 30th of the benefit they're going to receive. That's based on the service they've done to date. And that's really would be the accumulation of all those past 20 years worth of normal costs that had happened as they were working. So what you do is that you take that normal cost, so you're keeping current, and then you look at your unfunded accrued liability, how much money do you have set aside to pay for this benef these benefits offset the liability? And in your, right now, pretty much it's zero, right, for all intents and purposes. So you would, your accrued liability would be the same as the unfunded accrued liability would be the same as that. So now you pay that off systematically, like with a bond or a loan. You pay it over, let's say, a 20 or a 30 year period of time. So if you do that every year, 
and eventually, and everything works out, you will then have that be, you will become fully funded. And all this new stuff, you're paying off because you're also paying the normal cost. So the arc is the normal cost, so this year's cost, plus a systematic payment, like a loan payment, on the unfunded accrued liability. So that's, that's really what we're calculating. That's really the main cost. And what you think of it as what you should be contributing. Now, it's not really. It, this is just an accounting standard. They can't tell you to fund or not fund. That's a decision that you make. This is just how it's reflected on your books. So then they go through and they say, well, how much are you contributing of that arc? Well, you might be thinking you're contributing how much right now? Zero, right? But that's not right. You are contributing because you're paying for the retirees. They're getting a benefit, right? They're getting their health insurance. So you're, who's paying for that? You're paying for that. So you take the cost of that and you subtract it from the arc and it, that's how much you need to reflect on your books each year. So eventually, systematically, you're getting all of that cost onto your books over that 20, 30 year period of time. And that's really, and that accumulation of what the difference between what you paid, should have paid, and what you did pay is called the NOO, the net OPEB obligation. And so it, they didn't say you have to put this on your books right away, you just have to, yeah, there's, a, it's, there's a process where it's going to be reflected on and it's going to be accumulating onto your books. And um, there's a couple of important points that I haven't made yet, but I'll sort of talk about that. Um, if you look at what, uh, for those who have the, the Amherst report, you can see on page th uh, three that the Unfunded accrued, the unfunded accrued liability is, is under, is really, is $94 million. So that's if you had, a, if you had been doing this from day one and everything had worked out, you'd have $94 million in the pot to, ref, to offset that, but you don't. So it's, you just have the $94 million worth of liability. But now I'm reminding you, that's not a real liability. That's just a representation of what the liability is. It could be that or it could not be that. That's using what we call a three, uh, using a three and a half percent interest rate when we deduct what future events, or sort of think of it in, in another way, like if you had assets, how much you would earn, you'd earn three and a half percent. That's not very much in the long term. Uh, people have been, that's, it, there's some peculiar not peculiar, but some ways that GASB has said you have to pick that interest rate, and I'll talk about that. But just to give you a sense of why that's not the liability number, if you use the 7.75% interest rate, which is another possibility, a higher interest rate, meaning that you could earn more money in the long term, the liability would only be 48 million. When I say only, I mean compared to the 93 million. So which one's right? 48, 93, it sort of depends. You have, to, you have to think about what those mean. So you can't just blindly take these things. So what Gatsby, oh, let me just sort of continue one. And the normal cost, but we'll just do it under the 3.5% one scenario. That one year cost is like $5 million. So, you ha so typically you'd have to put that $5 million in and then you would have to make a payment on that $93 million uh, Ninety-four million dollars each year, and that would give you the arc. In this case, it, in the first year, it's eight point two million dollars. That would be, and this is for the retirees plus the future retirees. Okay. Now, why do I show two interest rates? There are two interest rates because Gasby says if you are not funding this, so meaning that you're not putting in anything any assets that will accumulate, that the only thing you're putting in is what we call the pay-as-you-go number, just the amount for the current retirees, then you use a low number, something which is representative of the long-term rate of return for uh, town assets. So we, have, we picked 3.5%, and sometimes we've used higher. You could go, I've seen lower, 
So, but that gives you a sense of what it, what it is. Um, now 7.75, that is if you were fully funding it, you were putting in that arc, that whole arc, every year, you have a co and you have a commitment to continue doing that. It's not just one time that you have a commitment to putting that in every year until you're fully funded. That would be how, what kind of earnings that you would get if you have a pool of money and you're investing it, similar to a pension plan. You're investing it in, in equities, you're investing it in things like fixed income, you're investing it in uh, hedge funds, you're investing it in uh, real estate. There's many other asset classes that you can do. So if you look at like a long-term rate of return for most pension plans around, it's really, it's between eight and 9%. You know, people think, oh, they'll never get this. But they really, they, it, there's been a lot of evidence that Yes, you will get that. And yes, maybe times have changed, some, but they haven't changed to the point where sometimes you'll hear people talk about, oh, they're only gonna get 4%. It's, it's always based, what it is is that it's really hard to have a long-term view of this. You have to be old like me, so where I remember in the you know, early 80s and where when there was 14% interest, or long-term bonds paying more than that, government bonds paying more than 30 year bonds paying, I wish I had some, <laughs> that would be incredible. So you have to sort of think about it, you know, we're in a historically low, very actually even a strange period of time right now where you lend money to the government, a 10 year bond, and you lend it at a negative real interest rate for 10 years. It's lower than, in, it's lower than inflation. That's not a normal, that's not normal. People don't, in general, have that p policy. So we're not in a normal environment, investment environment. So the 7.75 was supposed to be representative of a hype. If you were to invest and you were to put it into a relatively well, um, more aggressive portfolio, something that would have something like 70, 75 percent equities and hedge funds and those type of things, which is sort of pretty typical now of a, of a a retirement system. Now, you might not do it. I don't know what your investment policy is, neither do you, because there is no money to invest. It's all hypothetical. But given that if you were fully funding it, this number now goes, as I said, goes from 94 to 48. And the ARC also goes from 8.2 million down to 4.5 million. So it's a very significant uh, decrease. And one of the things that would be, you should realize that that OPEB cost, the, uh, during 2013, is someplace around the, what you're currently paying is about 2.6 million. So to fully fund this, it would be that you would have to put in someplace from the 4.5 to the 2.6, you'd have to put in a cash contribution above what you're currently paying of about one point, um, what was it, 2.6, so 1.9 million. So still a very big number, but not as inconceivable as this when you read that $93 million number. You know, if, if everyone thinks about things like that, you would, people would never have bought, would never buy a house, right? You know, I don't know if you remember, the first time you buy a house, you think like, how am I ever gonna be able to pay this off? But you do, you do it partially and systematically and by doing that. And that's the same way you have to treat these type of, of uh, benefits. So um, now I did address the NOO a bit. And for an example, that would be on, you can see that on page 21 for those who have copies of the report. Uh, for fiscal 2013, this is the, if you remember, is the amount that you didn't pay from the ARC. But you have to remember, this is under the unfunded scenario. So it's using this very, very low interest rate, which makes the numbers very big, much bigger than if you were funding it. Under that concept, you have $23 million has been accumulated, which shows up on your books as sort of a liability under your, um, it actually ends up showing up on your balance sheet of the finance. It doesn't really show up in the expense. It shows up really in the balance sheet. So, uh, and then that accumulates. And one of the things about these is 
bonding a, you know, rating agencies, they're, gonna st they're starting to look at these and look at them more carefully, and they're going to use these to calculate your uh, bond ratings, too. So that's one of the th reasons why there's more and more interest in people um, paying, starting to fund this. However, I will want you to say there's sort of some issues of intergenerational uh, equity here that what happened is the past generation who was getting the service for the people, they weren't paying for it. If you think about it, if you had a, a plan and you had, well, just active employees, you would have to put in zero. There would be no cost for it because no one's retired. And we remember we're only talking about retiree benefits. So they go through, they get all this service for 20, 30 years, they're happy, they haven't paid anything, and then all of a sudden it starts showing up. So now they have to start paying it. That generation has to pay it, even though they're not getting the service. But they're not paying for their own. They're paying for the prior year's people, but they're not paying for their own. So when you start funding, you're actually the generation which does both, that you start paying for your own, that's the normal cost, plus the piece of the accrued liability that's represented from the future retirees, the current active people for the past service. You start paying for those, plus you start paying for the, continue to pay for the people who went, who are already retired, who you didn't get the service from, those ta your taxpayers. So there's some challenges here and to look at it. But you can also look at it, the current level of taxpayers Certain things that were built in the town, the, the roads and all sorts of things, that came from those prior people too, those prior retirees. And the current generation of taxpayers is getting the advantage of some, many, some of those services already. They're still there. It's, it's a little more durable. So the, it's maybe a little fairer than it might initially seem to be the generation to grab it. You should be paying for your own, plus you're still getting some of the advantage from those retirees. That's really the um, bulk of my uh, sort of explanation of the OPEBs. Uh, these are pretty big numbers, and they're, as I said, it, it just if you changed by one percent, how one every year, how fast medical inflation goes up. So where we assumed that it was five percent, it actually went, goes up six. In reality. This arc would go up about 25, 30 percent. It's very, very sensitive to these future things, and that's because there's a lot of compounding of these costs. So actually, we're assuming five things like five percent increases in medical costs, but now you're when you discount things, if you, you know, from the future, you're discounting at only three and a half percent. So the present value of something that costs a dollar now, next year it's going to cost a dollar five, right? That's the five percent increase. But then when we discount it back to the present day, for those who are familiar with present value, we're only discounting by three and a half cents. So that means that something that costs a dollar now, it's you know it's a dollar. That present value that's a dollar, and then something that same thing next year has a present value now of one point of one dollar and one and a half cents. So it's actually more expensive, things that are happening into the future, than if it happens now. That is a really sort of Alice in Wonderland sort of type of thing. So if you think about that over a couple of years, if you take that medical, that $100 x-ray, it's going to go up. It's going to cost $1,000 eventually. And then you bring it back down. Well, the present value of that hundred of that hundred dollar X-ray, which is going to happen twenty years from now, might very well be two hundred dollars. It's a little strange. So that's part of the thing that contributes, particularly when the, with the very low interest rate, why those numbers are so big. Now these might not occur. We might not get that five percent. Or you look at them, and then you say that three and a half percent is really too low. So I hope this gives you a, a sense of this. It's so now. What do you do with this information? The idea of it, it's just an accounting standard. You put it on your books. That's what it's for. But now if you want to start funding it, then there are some challenges. Where do you find the money to do it, and how do you do that? And that's some of the questions which we can talk about, and I'll, be as, I'll try to answer as well as I can. But why don't I turn it over to you and sort of say, I've thrown out a lot of information. and. First, is there any questions? 
start with Rick. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. A um, few questions. One is, this is obvious, I think, but does a fully funded state mean that somewhere in the future you've got an asset on your balance sheet equal to the liability? Yes. Okay. But you still have to pay your normal cost mm -hmm. because you're still accumulating more assets. And then the still arc, more liability, sorry. Right, right. The ARC payment, is that calculated to get you to that state in X years? And if so, what's X? Um, well, there was a calculation in there, and that is, um, um, I think we used a third, yeah, we reset it to 30 years with an increasing amortization. So it actually is sort of pushing some of the, kicking the can a little bit down the road okay. there. But it's meant to be sort of, 30 years, which would be sort of level as a percentage of payroll. That's really the goal. Then I see, I've got the regional report here, but the pay-as-you-go number for region is about 1.8 million. I think that's for last year. Is there somewhere in the report that says what you, I know it's a guess, but what you think the pay-as-you-go would be 30 years from now? Um, there's an estimate, but I wouldn't say 30 years because those numbers are just no good yeah. because which we say in the report, because we, we're not counting new, we're not putting in new entrants. And so 30 years from now, you have people who you haven't even hired yet who are going to be getting benefits. So we're not trying, so we don't really, you know, so we just use it from the current people. So all these things, you, you have to periodically do it every two years. So, you know, looking down 30 years from now is, isn't really a, all that useful uh, exercise. Um, but yes, there is a, um, wherever the funding schedule is, uh, that's on 33, page 33 on the regional report, I think, assuming my table of contents was right. Yeah, you can see that would be what looks like on the right-hand column on that. So uh, let's just go, instead of 30 years, let's go down to uh, something like 2026 or 2025, 26, 25, and you're talking about 2.7 million. Okay, great. And after that, you know, yeah. your new entrants would be coming in who we haven't included and then would be retiring. So yeah, this, and, but even, even this is, this is pretty muddy, you know, it, it sort of depends on what actually happens. Now, one of the things I will say is that what's going to happen to the future, you know, we're talking way into the future. Well, these benefits can change. Unlike what most people consider um, for retirement benefits, there's no real guarantee of these benefits. Matter of fact, you change them all the time. You, you sometimes you change the interest, how much people have to pay. You change plans, you do, to get rid of medics, you get change Fallon, you, you go here, you go there. So you're making changes all the time on these benefits. Mm -hmm. So there are, so it's not the same. So there has been a recent proposal by the uh, governor and other people which would address somewhat this and, th and it would include changing it for a significant group of your current employees, those, of those future retirees. There would be a grandfathering and then, but then people who aren't that close to retirement mm -hmm. uh, would be, um, would be, uh, have the rules sort of changed for, for them, sort of the rug pulled out a little bit. And in the case in that where, uh, I'm trying to remember correctly, do you remember, uh, maybe you can help me, how much do you pay uh, as a percentage? It's 80 or 75, depending on the plan. Okay, so you pay a relatively high percentage. What would happen would be that if you had retired, let's say with 10 years of service, you would only get maybe 50% of that benefit. And then if, as you get further up in, as your career, if you have a longer career, then you will get more of that. So maybe working your way up towards the, an 80% type of things. So that's significant, but not as significant as you might think, because even though you might be paying, thinking 80%, you're paying 80% of the premium. The real cost of that plan is actually quite a bit more because the premium for retirees is much less, typically, than the value of the benefit. And that's because um, you have plans here where you have people who are mixed. You have a plan you might have a 20-year-old in and you have an 80-year-old in. Now, you, they're both paying the same premium. Which one do you think is going to spend more money? 
Well, the reality is it's the 80-year-old by a ton. And if you, we have some um, statistics uh, in here, and particularly in another presentation we did, just to give you an indication of how it changes. From a 50-year-old to a 70-year-old, the 70-year-old is 200% of what the 50-year-old, the expected costs are. So you can see a 20-year-old and an 80-year-old, even though they're paying the same premium, and you're theor you know, they're, or the employee is theoretically paying 20% or this change plan would be paying 50%, they're paying 50% of the premium, but the cost is maybe three, four times what the premium is. And finally, you said um, if you put some amount into a fund, GASB lets you use the favorable interest rate so you can book less of the liability on your balance sheet. Do they, are they clear about how much you have to fund? Or yes, you have to fund basically the ARC oh. until you're funded. Larry, and th there are some issues about that, particularly if you don't do it from day one, so there's some issues. If you were putting in a partial ARC, then you would have some discount rate that would be between the right. three and a half and the seven and a half, and, and it's sort of a melded rate depending on how close you're getting to that ARC. Right, and, that, and it's, it's sort of an interesting thing because it's actually circular because the ARC is dependent on the interest rate, and the interest rate is dependent on how much of the ARC you're putting in. So there are some methods that we use to sort of get around that. And, uh, but the answer is that's called partial funding, what Sandy is referring to. So, and like I said, there's no requirement to fund. It's, it's a choice. It's a policy choice. Uh, if you want to maintain these benefits, or that's one of the reasons. There are some intergenerational equity reasons. You should be, in, in, in a lot of concepts, people, a lot of people feel that people who get service should pay for the service. So that's one of the other concepts that are in there. There's some philosophical and, and policy type of concepts that, are, are, that you need to decide when you're doing this, not just whether or not you can afford it. That's part of it, I'm sure. Bob, did you Talk a little bit about our uh, municipal colleagues and what they're doing in terms of funding their OPEB. It's a kind of a bleak landscape out there in terms of uh, folks actually, actually either funding up to their ARC, even putting trust funds aside. And just we, we're feeling pretty proud. We have a trust fund. We have $500,000 in that trust fund. It's a start. Um, but just talk about how we look relative to others. And I guess a follow-on question is if, you know, we're often held hostage by this concept of the rating agencies, Standard & Poor's is going to come down on our head. If they drop our bond rating by a notch, it's, it's peanuts relative to any funding of, of our OPEB. So that, that doesn't seem like a big fear, especially when you look across the landscape and you see that hardly any of our right. brethren you were compared to other people are, are doing much. So just talk about a little bit about right. the dynamics. But one of the things that I said, it also dependent on the plan that you have too when you're comparing yourself. Because one of the things that this now allows them to do is that if you have a richer plan, then you don't look as good as maybe somebody else. So even if you were both not funding and you have the richer plan or that you have the poorer plan, or when I say rich or poor, I mean in terms of uh, the level of benefits, richer being higher, higher benefits. Um, so that will can affect your uh, age, your caught, your bond ratings. And if nothing else, you have to remember, eventually you have to pay for this. This is just what we're really doing is just budgeting. We're just showing you what is a reasonable budget. And the idea being that, you know, we don't really know, but it, you have to still pay attention to it because just because you're budgeting for snow removal and it didn't snow last year, it doesn't mean that you don't budget for it this year. So if you're going to have snow, you need to pay for it one, sometime or the other. It's a question of when you choose to pay for it, but you still have to pay for it, no matter whether you're using 3.5% or 7.5%, percent you still have to pay for the cost, the benefits or the benefits, what you, whatever you're giving to people. So... This is, there's no magic beans here that, uh, so you have to think about how you can, what you can do about that. Well, a lot of municipalities are starting to develop funds and a lot of them 
are starting to put in $100,000, $500,000. I've worked with, been working with uh, uh, Arlington for like 20 years on this issue. And we've had quite a while, and they have something like four or five million dollars in their fund. But that's really, you know, as I referred to it, as it's better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick, but it's still not the level that you sort of really want if you're really truly funding it. So what, what can you do? You know, um, it, it's going to, you know, when people started funding retirement, they, people also thought, we're never going to be able to get this funded. And eventually these will get funded. And that's one of the things I know I've talked with Sandy is hopefully as Hampshire County retirement system becomes more fully funded and where people are recovering now from 2008, which has been a tremendous, and actually 2000 and what was it, 2000, 2001, <coughs> 2002, which were also bad years. Um, it's been a difficult decade. But now it's been pretty good. I went to, you know, people, I went to a meeting this, they paid five, they made 5% in the first quarter. That's pretty good uh, at a pension plan I went to today. Um, so people, eventually those plans are going to get well funded. And then you're going to be able to take some of that money because you're going to only have to be paying the normal cost. It's a very similar concept in retirement because you have enough money to cover the unfunded. Um, the unfunded will be zero, um, then you can shift some of that money towards funding this. That's sort of the hope and the goal. And we were taught, but we were talking about that in Arlington. We thought that was going to happen 20 years ago, and it really hasn't, unfortunately. But it will. But one of the things about this is that I don't really feel there's any real need to fully fund this. The reality is, because these numbers aren't close enough to what the real numbers are, because I don't know what the real numbers are, and it's too sensitive to some <coughs> very difficult market forces, which you're not going to be able to calculate. <coughs> so you're going to want to get, if you're funding it, if you decide to fund for it, you're going to want to probably get to, this is a philosophical issue, but you're going to want to get to funding a bigger percentage of this. But you probably don't want to go and say, OK, we're really going to fund 100% of this because you don't really know. But you will soften the blow each year of having, um, having to put in you know, 20, eventually, instead of having to put in $40 million to, to pay your retirees, some of that money will be coming out of the trust, and you'll be able to use it to soften the blow. So it will be $20 million instead of the $40 million. That's sort of the goal of it. Um, but a lot of places are starting to do this. I mean, it is definitely a thing. And, any, and many systems that, uh, or entities that have revenue sources, uh, such as um, Massport, um, you know, Mass Housing Finance, they're starting to fund. Actually, I don't think MWRA has started funding yet, but many places. And you're starting to see um, various enterprise units starting to fund too because they have some sort of revenue source and they want to build it into the rates. When you think about it, the people, even more than who gets the service, the people who get the, you know, the electricity or whichever, whatever the enterprise unit is providing, they should be paying for those, they should be paying for those, uh, uh, the benefits that are being paid and accrued. So you're starting to see those, all those type of things. So the answer is, so now you can do other things. You can lower the benefit. You can shift the benefit. You can shift it to the, employ to the employees, the retirees. You can shift it to other governments. That's another way people do this. Like they do things like Medicare Part D carve outs, which is where you basically, everybody, instead of going into MedEx, for example, they go into, for their, they go Medicare Part D for their uh, prescription drugs. And instead of having Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, providing their drugs, you're getting it through some other plan, and the government is paying for some of it, that. There's lots of different ways you can do it. You can shift some can of the we, cost. Can we shift it to Australia? <laughs> I, I like Australia. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's not much, you know, the cost is the cost. And you, so you can either figure out ways to more efficiently or, or 
for less cost, provide the same benefit, provide lower benefits, shift the cost to somebody else, or you can fund and then try to invest well and take that investment earnings and use that to do that. But you have to make a decision, you know, which is a better use of your funds. You know, do you need that fire engine or do you need this? But I can tell you I work for a client in Rhode Island, and I don't know if you had read about their pensions in Rhode Island. It's just a disaster. And I got told by the former police chief that I should go to jail because for 25, I've been the actuary for 25% of the life of that plan, and it's an incredible mess. Well, you should have told somebody. Well, first, I did tell somebody. I told my clients. And then who should I have told? The police? It was the police plan. <laughs> but if I had told that same police chief that we don't, we don't want you to hire any police officers, we don't want you to buy any cruisers, and if I told the fire chief that he can't buy that pumper, etc., you know, they, and we're going to take all that money and we're going to put it away for use 30 years from now, you know, I wouldn't have, I would have gotten a scream. So it's, it's, it is very philosophical. You have to decide whether, which one is better for you. And also the fact is, are you going to get the use of that money and are you going to earn, be able to earn the 7.5%? Also the trouble is that when you do accumulate a big pot of money, like when you fund, you get, a, you get all this extra volatility that comes out because you have $100 million in a fund. Now, if you have a year like 2008, all of a sudden you lost $30 million. That's a big percentage of your budget. I'm sorry, to, am yeah, I going no, too far? No, that's, no it's, it's good. Uh, you had mentioned a number before, and, um, I, which is a pay-go number for projecting into the future, and I didn't know <laughs> if that was hypothetical or real. But I think that the question that always comes up is, we don't do the, we don't set anything aside, and we just continue on pay as you go forever. Um, are there numbers that show what um, our future finance committees and select boards and school committees are going to be confronting as a pay-go number well, in 30 years from now? Well, I, not 30 years, because I really that that you have to do a little more than we did for this study in that because we would have to get the new entrants coming in and make a whole bunch of assumptions, and we haven't done that. Uh, but in the first 30 years when you're paying, doing a funding schedule, in general you're paying more than the pay as you go because you're covering the cost of the current retirees, which is the pay as you go pretty much, and you're covering the cost of your current, your future retirees, your active people. So, so while you're funding, Yes, there's a lot of pain compared to just even doing the pay as you go, but then eventually you get to a point, or you could be doing a partial funding, either way, but hopefully you can get good investment returns, and that uh, can soften some of these numbers. Um, but the answer is that when you start funding, you actually, there is some pain to that, because you're now the one standing up and saying, we're the ones who are taking control of this. Yeah, and I guess the reason we would choose to <coughs> incur the pain if we did was because we're trying to protect those future town uh, uh, boards from much greater pain. And so that's why I was asking the question, right. do we know um, how much greater that pain is? Does it go up on a percentage basis that's uh, greater than inflation, and how much greater than inflation then? Um, let's see if I can find an answer for you. Well, I can give you an example. The, the pay-as-you-go number, we, like 30 years from now, is like 4.7 million, and that's actually definitely too low. That it's probably because it doesn't have those new entrants, as I was saying, in, in it. So I would probably guess that it would be, and this is just wild, not even back of the envelope, um, you know, probably six million dollars, and you're going from, um, I hate looking at the numbers all the way at the end because they're just so <laughs> meaningless, because <laughs> they're just too wild, there's just too much projection. Um, it, it, I really can't, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that, but the answer is that, but the overall, yes, you, 
do uh, eventually you come out and that you are in a much better position. You know, think about it. You have this hundreds of million, hundred million dollar pot of money which can be going is being used to offset this liability. So that's a great thing, and that we'll be using it, and they'll and they will be thanking you just like the pension people are. Like I have lots of clients who are they have twenty million dollars worth of pension, and they're only currently paying ten million dollars towards that because they have a pot of money which is going towards that and the investment earnings is paying for some of that. Melissa? Thank you. Andy's looking at me nervously because he knows how I feel about funding OPEP. Um, so <laughs> given that, uh, I'm actually going to ask you to go a little broader philosophically than we've even gone so far just because you've done this so many other places. So you're having lots of conversations in other places whereas we haven't had a lot of thrilling open But no, Amherst is a great place to have a conversation. So, <laughs> one of the things that's a little hard for us to see, for some of us to see, is how our healthcare industry, insurance industry, could possibly be like it is now, 20 years from now, because it's so incredibly broken. Right. So I agree with that. Given that. What did people think, not that you're old enough to know, but what did people think was going on with this 20 years ago? Okay. Well, I, I have mean, a good answer for you. I'm trying to get a, you know, a bigger I have a good picture. answer for you. When we project this and we were projecting it and you were having periods of time where you were, it was 10, 15 percent increases every year. And I remember I made a projection and I said, okay, it's going to go 10, 15 percent, then it's going to go 14 percent, 13 percent, 12, and it's going to keep on ratcheting down until it's going to get to some place which was going to be like 6%. And I had a town manager say to me, you know, no, no, no. That doesn't make sense. How can you be doing that? This is all broken. But then I said to him, think about it. Eventually, if you keep getting 15% increases, 10% increases, this is, will no longer be the town of Amherst. This will be the town of Mass General. And they will own everything in the whole Commonwealth. This has to change. We don't know how it's going to change. And yes, and so we build that into our assumption. Our ultimate medical trend, we grade down, typically, until it looks like a, um, something which is representative of infla inflation, plus, um, inflation plus GDP growth. The idea being is that it becomes, that eventually there's going to be reach some equilibrium of this, of medical costs as a percentage of medical of GDP. And it has already gone in like a 10-year period, it went from like 12 percent of GDP to over, to over around 18 percent of GDP in a little over 10 years. So when does that stop? You know, I've heard some projections at 24 percent, but I, you know, what do I know? And, uh, that, like I said, this was just to be a represent, you know, where, what we try to do is just make some sort of representation of this. So we do build that into this. But there's other points that could happen. This could be, you know, we could get into a single payer system, nationalized uh, health care. Maybe you won't be providing retiree health care. That's a possibility too. And you're going to have this irrevocable trust. But it won't be just you. It will be you and every, uh, everybody else. So the purpose of this trust will go away and you'll probably be able to break the trust. I can't give you a legal opinion, but I'm sure that there's going to be some way that that money isn't just going to have to keep on sitting into a trust that um, is no reason for. If every, you know, if it's reason for it goes away. So, but what happens if it doesn't? That doesn't happen. So, I'm not for funding or against funding. It's something you have to decide before in terms of what you do. If you want to maintain this benefit, and you want to eventually get to the point where uh, you're really paying for your own cost, which is really something which does make sense. There's a real, um, uh, there's some really, I find that personally very appealing that you pay for your, what you get. And uh, so the, the right amount, and that's the trouble is that wasn't done in the past. So how do you fix that? You can keep on ignoring it, or you can be the one that takes it, or you can do someplace in between. There's lots of different philosophies to do it. But my thought is that if you at least start partially funding this, I don't think it's harmful. 
and then try to progress. But the real thing that you have to do is look at the benefits. Look for, just like you're doing for your healthy, your active employees, their benefits, not just for when they retire, but their current benefits. You have to keep on looking at ways to get that, to provide that in an efficient manner. Same thing will goes for the retirees. And you can go through and that will help this. You can look at cost sharing. That's the possibility. You can cost shift to some of the retirees, shift to, to the feds. Then you can start funding this. And then you try to build on it. Because you can't, no one, I only have one, I have one client that actually did go and put in more than the ARC. They put in three times their ARC the first year. But they were sort of getting ready for it. And they had all these trust funds that didn't exist. There was no reason for any more. And so they had accumulated all this money. And they're a rate, they have a revenue source other than taxes. So they can do it. But most people can't do that. So they go through and they sort of say, okay, we're going to put in $500,000. Then we're going to put it. Then next year you have to put in 700, and then the year after that you have to put in 800 or 900. You have to keep on building. You can't be keeping it level because your costs are going to go up, and that's really the only way. And municipal budgeting, I don't need to tell of, of FinCom, of, uh, but of all people, is that it's really not the actual number that's the problem. It's where you are relative to where you were next last year. It's where the bar is. So if you never set the bar. You never pay for it if you never pay anything. So that's my argument, I guess, for at least partial funding. <coughs> Two questions. Well, one is very short and one is a little longer. Um, the short one is GASB requires this uh, as an accounting for government entities. Is there an equivalent for corporate plans? Yes. Okay. That was my short answer. <laughs> Okay, and the second question is, you seem to say that, that we do not have a, uh, a Medicare component to um, drug benefits in um, post-retirement? I'm not, I'm just saying as an, ex an example, Medicare so carve-out, but I don't statement. think you do, but you know, there is, uh, the, uh, you might do, there's other ways to do it. There's this 28% subsidy that come, that you get if you don't have your people in Medicare uh, Part D and you're providing them post-retirement medical and that goes into either a general revenue source, it would go back to the town or if in your case, if you're in a group plan, they probably have, uh, they're somehow getting that money and they're using it to lower the premiums. We don't need to go through it now, but it's just, I'm just. It's, there are some like ways that doesn't just get lost. Yeah, I'll turn to Sandy to respond to that, I think. So we do provide a drug benefit to our retirees, and we do get reimbursement under Medicare Part D uh, from the federal government. The 28%. The 28%. Uh, subsidy. Right. Yeah. And that's general revenue source. And one of the things I like to think of is, for me, is like if you're funding, it would be, that would be a good place to start if you're trying to fund, because if that Well, and, and in fact, at this town meeting, we're taking last year's check from Medicare and distributing it to the Amherst OPEB Trust Fund and to the town of Pelham and to the regional school district so they can put that money into their own OPEB Trust Fund. So we are taking advantage of the fact that the federal government is giving us uh, a subsidy to provide this drug benefit and using that as a funding source for OPEB. Wow, I'm your straight man. <laughs> I had no idea that you were doing that. <laughs> But that's one of the things which I do recommend, because if you can't get that money, you're never going to be able to fund, because that's money which is really, you can see the direct connection for it. Thank you. Uh, just to make it clear uh, for everybody who's here, it's Article 12. It's one of the budget amendments um, that will be offered for um, the, at the town meeting for the FY13 budget. And um, the numbers that we have there, um, and it's um, under, um, I believe, motion C. No, wait a minute. No, um, yeah, um, it's motion C, right? And uh, it's $78,270 is the total amount. And we're going to be proposing to put $57,055 ,055 into the Amherst OPEB Trust Fund because we can't make 
decisions um, for other entities that we're proposing to just transfer those m the other money, uh, three thousand six hundred and eighteen to the town of Pelham and seventeen thousand five hundred ninety-seven dollars to the Amherst Pelham Regional School District, and um, it's really uh, up to each entity to decide what to do of those three only. Amherst is uh, included in the motion to specifically put it into an OPEB trust. Yes, Kip. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much for putting the book together. Um, it makes for a very absorbing reading. I'm still trying to tackle that. Um, um, <laughs> and, and if you believe that, I guess I can have a few other stories to share with you. Um, uh, for me, as a member of the school committee, what really resonates are the opportunity costs uh, underlying this decision. And in very, very tight budget times, um, trying to wrap my head around the idea of being uh, due dil diligent and responsible and recognizing both our current and future liabilities and um, also um, our commitment to future generations, both children as well as members of the school committee, uh, I'm trying to come to an understanding of how I might frame for our constituencies um, a commitment to placing X number of dollars, in some cases quite a bit, aside for legitimate liability, but also doing so by taking money away, hence the opportunity cost, from current programs that are part of our school. Um, and I think what makes me even more nervous about that decision and the enormous responsibility that goes with it is somewhat similar to what Alyssa was, I think, concerned with, and that is the medical, the healthcare industry. My concerns are with the financial institution industry. And I'm not convinced that 2008 was an anomaly. Um, and so my concern is if we're putting money aside in this trust, what are your thoughts, what are the guidelines that we might consider to ensure the highest level of protection of those funds so that if we're putting money away today for the future, that a duplication of 2008 doesn't occur in, say, 2020 and wipes out a good portion of those funds? Um, um, my th thoughts about that is that um, it's, it's a personal philosophy that you have to do in terms of your level of risk, and that's what you look at. But for those people who are taking their money and putting it into very secure investments, I think there are going to be sadly, uh, personally, this is just my personal opinion, I'm not an investment consultant, so I can't answer you that. But, you know, for those, if, you know, like when you're paying a 10-year bond, which is paying, you know, less than 2 percent, that doesn't make sense to me. So I think that, you know, equity type of instruments are really going to be the only way to go. And one of the plans is possibly to put it into, a PRIT, into the PRIT fund, which is really the state pension fund. And you can join that under certain circuit, the general fund. There's some places that you can't. But it, it basically, you can get the, some very professional management. Now, that might, you know, that does not say there won't be another 2008. But for all those people who, uh, since 2000, you know, it t pulled their money out after 2008, they're very sorry. You have to ride it. Um, this is in my personal philosophy. But one of the troubles with that is what I started to address is that you have this big pool of money, this $100 million, this theoretical $100 million. Well, that's very, can't, there's a lot of volatility there. And that is a problem. But there are means you don't typically have to make up for it in one year. You know, you, it's, this is, think of this as, I like the analogy I like the best is steering a super tanker. You know, you're not going sharp turns here. And when you're looking at sharp turns and you look at it for every year, a year is a sharp turn when you're talking about these type of liabilities. These liabilities are developing over a 30, 40, 20, 
30-year period of time, and they're paid out over another 20, 30-year time frame. So we're, one year doesn't make it. You know, either way, you know, we, we're having, you know, like last year, we had good, really good returns, 13% in a, in a fairly, you know, typical, in a fairly uh, well-diversified portfolio. So that's great. And, but then you had this thing where it was, you know, 30%. I mean, that was terrible. But it's actually come back since then. And, you know, when people say that it was a lost generation, it wasn't as lost as people think. If you just look even at the S&P, you know, over a 10-year period of time, it, it almost exactly the same number. But it actually earned about 2% because most people don't quote that there's another version of it which gives you the returns with the dividends. So I think that overall, a well-diversified portfolio is probably the best way to go. But I can't, that isn't my expertise. That's my understanding. I've been following this since I've been four years old. That was just a couple of years ago. And I would, I would just add, if I could, that so we are looking at what to do with the money for Amherst and where to put it. And as Larry said, one of the possibilities, in which um, is my strong recommendation that we do, and I've been talking about this with our treasurer, collector Claire McGinnis, and with John Musanti, is to put the money into the state. Um, Basically, there's a carve-out of the state pension fund that's set aside for OPEB funds. And so what you get is the value of the professional management and a highly diverse pool that is in equities, that is in uh, you know, small slices of hedge funds or maybe small slices of real estate, some international... Timber. Some <laughs> timber. <laughs> um, but... Uh, where, where they can diversify and manage and do the research at a much higher level than we could ever do ourselves internally. Or frankly, than I think even some of these um, smaller private money managers can do and do it at much less cost. So yeah, I don't know what the market's going to do, but I think putting that money aside in a fund that has shown itself to be well managed is probably our best way to guard ourselves against future risk. But you can't remove the risk. And there's other risks too. People could live longer, medical costs could spike. There's, this is, you're just doing things which make sense, which are prudent and are reasonable. But then not a guarantee. May I have follow? Yeah, I, I think with all due respect, one of the things that I w was struck by your presentation was where the Several times you made references to um, well, Alice in Wonderland, for example, and um, fantastical kinds of situations, and also saying that we really don't know what's going to happen. And I think that's a concern of a number of us. There's so many unknowns. The, the numbers are so uncertain that when I go back to my initial comment about you know playing off one the, the, the needs for today versus the needs for um, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years from now, um, the needs currently for me loom much more important because of the incredible unknowns f down, down the road a piece. And yet I, I, I respect the responsibility and the obligation for the liability. It's just that tension that I'm trying to come to grips with. Uh, there's a few things. One, for example, like if I often will have as an actuary, people will tell me, well, when am I going to die? And I said, I really can't tell you, but if there, I had a thousand of you, I can probably tell you how many are going to die. Same thing here. These are pretty reasonable choices that you're making. And you just can't, risk is not a bad thing. Risk is, is also opportunity. So the fact is that if you, do, you can actually see what will happen if you do nothing. So that's sort of the tension that you're talking about. So I do appreciate that, but I do, I've been working in the public sector for well over 20 years, and I will say, I've almost never had a client tell me that this is a good year. Uh, yes, Doug. Um, a couple of more comments and questions, really, and it gets to Kip's point a little bit. I think that the balancing factor for me in some respects around this is, um, not to oversimplify the sort of situation, but the short term is, is the short way to think about this in some ways is that 
regardless of what the you know the 93 million sort of number versus the 48 million the main thing to recognize is that it's not zero nor is it going to be zero uh, for one thing and so there's some uh, uh, reasonableness to using interest to help pay for some of that number which is part of what partially funding or fully funding does is allow interest to sort of cover some of that long-term cost the second thing that I, I would point out is that you know the and and it and it ties into the current needs and that is that you know in a way the no, the nature of these benefits are a covenant with the current employees about the future and if we get too aggressive with things like plan changes or we're too volatile with things like plan changes and and that sort of thing uh, it undermines uh, the trust with those employees and and therefore ultimately undermines how well they do what they do for us I think in some respects and those are all very very subtle things but they're equally uh, to be balanced against uh, these arguments in 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 the the context of the whole so I think that that's another piece to think about is that you know part of like with the pension reform that I mean the uh, retirement benefit reform bill that's that's you know in the in the state house right now that they're thinking about um, you know some of that grandfathering in is about how much time do we give people to adjust their retirement planning um, you know I think for myself personally you know I've got a little while left but I don't have as much time as I had 10 years ago and the nature of what health care costs are now versus 10 years ago versus 20 years ago are significant so the the you know employees are starting to think about you know health care benefits in their retirement years can I get it how much is it going to cost are they likely to change it on me um, and those kinds of things. So those are factored into people's decisions. So that's also part of that, that you know, calculus that we're trying to figure out here about what to do and when to do it and that sort of thing. But I think getting back to, to uh, you know, the, the immediate needs, you know, the, they are important and, and they're valuable. But at the same time, these long-term liabilities are still costs we're incurring now. So we, we have to keep in mind their immediate impact, even though the costs are paid out a long time from now. Anything else? Rick? What I kind of don't like about this is that I only see it as a balance sheet thing and not ever really helping with future costs. So use as an example, let's say we committed to do half a million a year for 20 years and you end up with 10 million at the end of that period, it's more than that because of the income, but, but using that as an example, then in year 20, you decide to start taking the investment income out. So take out half a million a year. That's nice. That helps. But you're still committed to put in half a million a year. So it's a net zero. So y you get out there to year 20, and you're still really paying in, uh, in your operating budget the, the pay-as-you-go payment. So it's really only if you ever get to be fully funded. Are you, you arguing for full funding? Uh, well, <laughs> if you could get to full funding, then you would stop, obviously, funding it, and you would only pull out the investment income, but we're never going to get there. So, well, I, mean, I will say that was the same feeling for retirement when I first started working on that. And now, you know, I do have clients. The client I was with this morning, they were, you know, they're almost 90% funded. But, but then, okay, that, that's... Like, true, but then if you did get there and you could start taking the investment and come out, that's a plus. But what have you, what has been the cost of having to put all that money in there? What didn't you do because you had to put all that money yeah. in there? So, I mean, it, it's, it's yeah. obviously a balancing act, but the thing is that if you're promising these benefits, you have to pay for them sooner or later. It's just a question of when and how you pay for it. So that's where you have to decide. It, you're still going to pay for them. Um, I just, I, I think that's a really important point. I mean, every dollar you put into your OPEB trust fund is opportunity cost. It's not half a teacher paving a street, and that's that's the toughest trade-off. I mean, every time we sit here and suggest that we put money into the fund, we're attempting to kind of look across the landscape and not ask Maria to, you know, come up with another $200,000 and a $600,000 shortfall from the elementary school budget. And that's right there is the challenge the town is going to have to face and ultimately make a decision about. And if it's an annual decision, it's going to be very, very difficult. If it's one giant decision, it's also going to be difficult. 
the number, I think, um, I, I'm not sure you meant to say what you said earlier, which was you wouldn't fund at the full arc, and that, no, that I, I was true. saying that you wouldn't fully, you wouldn't, you can still put it in the, to the full arc, but then you can stop before you actually reach 100% funded. I'm not right. saying you wouldn't, when I say you wouldn't go to full funding, I mean all the way up to 100% funded. Right. The full, no, and because and you agree, would eventually I, I stop because of that. I didn't want you to leave everybody with the impression that $500,000 was enough because it's, it's, it's obviously not. So, I, I, I mean, I, I see this in black and white. I used to see it in gray. I see either you go whole hog, you make a policy, you figure out what your number is. Maybe it's not $6 million this year, but it's, you know, three. And you go $3 million every year from here on in, and that's the line item in the budget. Everybody has to bite the bullet. They, you know, our municipal budget moves down a section and then stays there. <coughs> or you decide, you know what, this system is broken. It's going to have to be fixed somehow. It's going to be reformed a la the pension fund system by elongating the funding cycle, changes in health care. It, it doesn't seem like a gray area. It seems bipolar. Either you go one way or the other. And by the way, the only investment manager who matters right now is Ben Bernanke. <laughs> well, that's the trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's for good reason. Yeah, my question is on the, uh, the payment. You mentioned the $3 million, and that's uh, what you pay every year. Uh, my question is, in the prior audit, there was a recommendation you start at the three million but you increase it by the two and a half percent tax levy each year is that what you're recommending as we go through this i wasn't really making a recommendation whether you fund or not that is something which you have to decide in terms of what it is we do the presentation that we have on the full funding is that there is a variety of different ways to amortize the unfunded and this one does have an increase built into it of about three and a quarter percent we're sort of trying to match sort of pay, active payroll, which was we're assuming to go up at three and a quarter percent. Now it might not, but um, no, I wasn't pre predicting. I wasn't saying to with the tax levy. It's sort of how you get there is sort of what your job is. And um, actually, I but I do believe actually partial funding is a solution that most of my clients are leaning towards. I've had. Almost no towns talk about really fully funding right now, anyway. I guess I'm struck by the, the bipolar kind of discussion of it. And Access one. The, what it seems most like for me is a mortgage and what you yes. very few people have a non amortizing mortgage you know even if you only live in a house for 5 years or 10 years or 15 years you prefer to have less owed than when you started um, and that seems to me pretty much where this is is moving um, the second thing is um, i've spent a number of years working for a public pension fund and if you get to full funding, effectively all of the costs of it in the pension fund area were paid for by the, the earnings of the pension fund. And so that, that really does make a big difference. Uh, over the long, long run, if you ever got to that point, it also changes the dynamics between labor and management because if it doesn't cost you anything, why not give me more? You know, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> that's actually a, a whole other discussion. Anyway. I just want to, to share a concern. I, well, uh, first of all, an appreciation. We got this several weeks ago, and I actually did read it and maybe understood about that much of it. Um, and I appreciate it's only Sandy. this thick, so that well, was yeah. Yeah, this, <laughs> this much. That was one page. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate Sandy's answering a couple of questions that I had. The thing that, that I'm turning over in my mind is um, are the three towns that I know of that considered the have have engaged in the other option: Tom's River, uh, Detroit, and Stockton. Clearly, didn't um, pay enough into their fund. Central Falls. Well, there are others, but those are the three. Uh, and, and 
sort of the question that I don't expect, I hear that there's not an answer for tonight is, um, where are we in this, between this black and white? I, th I think, yeah, there is black and white. I'm not sure how black black is or white white is. Is it 48 million or 93? Is it two and a half? Is it a half? I, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm most concerned about um, sort of going in a, in a trajectory that will lead us to uh, Tom's River. And I'm sort of hopeful that we can figure out, and I don't know, there are lots of smart people in this room, um, how we can avoid that. Well, huh. not how to follow up on that. Uh, <laughs> That'd be rhetorical. Uh, yeah. The, uh, I, I think that it, it's to draw it to some conclusion um, with a couple of maybe three observations. Of course, one is that um, just to remind ourselves that we are on a path to fully funding the pensions that we um, support through the Hampshire County Retirement System and. We didn't have a similar meeting here. Um, we had a legislature essentially who told us we had to do it and kind of made it easier for us to participate in the Hampshire County Retirement System and set up a plan that is um, going to get us to full funding for our pensions. Uh, and there is always the possibility that the legislature or some outside body may come in and force our hands on this. And um, hopefully they will offer us some carrots if they, offer, if they uh, threaten us with some sticks. But um, we do have to know that and at least acknowledge it. Second thing in a very different course is that the earlier um, two entities that each of us have to deal with. For Pelham, it's the town and the region. For us, it's the town and the region. Because the region um, is a separate entity, but it is an entity that gets funded from four different towns. And um, so what your decision is going to be um, is an independent decision but does have an effect with us since the communication um, is very important for all of us um, and uh, we um, need to have continue to have these discussions in a forum where um, all of us are present um, for town meetings or um, other um, such forums as far as Amherst is concerned and speaking just to Amherst um, if you look at the um, spreadsheet that financial projections are presented on, and uh, you know it starts with the October meeting when uh, finance director presents his initial projections for the next year, you'll notice that there's a line that was zero in this year's, which was OPEB trust. But um, the thought in putting a line item was at least to make us conscious of it, and. Uh, when it comes around to uh, thinking about FY15, it's kind of hard to do because we haven't had the town meeting yet where we're dealing with FY14. Uh, but when we get around to that point, um, what we're going to have to um, give some thought to and do some work so that we're ready to be there at the time is at the point where we're establishing preliminary budget guidelines for that year we need to give some consideration to whether there should be a set aside amount and propose that. Um, and so I think that when it comes down to how this is gonna play out as to whether we're gonna set up a policy and um, then as was recommended in your report, uh, which was to set up a policy, so that very specifically and then to stick with it, I mean, it all, that's where it begins to play, to come together. And uh, because we don't want to make um, a huge shift um, that is going to affect operating budgets and capital budgets without discussion, um, we do need to have a mechanism um, between now and then to continue this discussion. Um, but. Uh, I think that that is when it's going to come to play is that the Finance Committee is going to have to issue a preliminary guideline 
for FY15, and we are going to have to be prepared to make a decision as to whether that number is going to be uh, zero and we're going to look for just opportunistic um, things to do um, as is happening this year or if we're going to do something on a more concerted basis and recognize what, that there are consequences to doing that, which we've all been talking about tonight. So um, I appreciate everyone coming and Gerald talking about this together because I think this is a decision, while it's ultimately going to fall in the Finance Committee to issue preliminary guidelines, uh, it's not something that we can do and avoid. We really need to be doing this in concert and discussion with all of you, um, or at least all of you except John, who gets a pass on this because he's going to have the discussion over in Pelham. <laughs> uh, so with that, if there are other questions or comments, I certainly welcome them. Otherwise, um, yes, Alyssa. And if I could just add, I mean, um, those of us on the yeah, I will speak for the select board and for my former role on school committee. I don't think any of us that joined select board or school committee joined with any intention of even understanding what benefits we offer to our teachers and our town employees in terms of 80-20, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, HMO, whatever, whether it's current employees or future employees. That's just not on our list of things to be concerned about. That's why we hire professionals to tell us what's the best thing to do for our employees so that we have that loyalty like Doug talked about, so that we have good schools, we have a good town, et cetera. Very few of us have been very interested <laughs> in that level of conversation. But in order to make those guidelines for the Finance Committee, I hope that you will you know, help lead us into having that conversation before we just start a guideline, because I feel like we're kind of missing that piece, and that's been t discussed tonight, but I want to make sure we don't lose sight of that, is that I don't fully understand what our different options are. I mean, this thing about the 28% is great and all that, but to understand what other communities are doing, you know, the comparable kind of thing we always look at, you know, we don't want to stiff our employees, we want loyal employees, we're in collective bargaining right now, we're going to be looking at FY4. So there is definitely timing issues associated with all this. Like you said, not only are we not in town meeting yet, but there are a lot of different factors at play. But it's, it's a complicated conversation that I think we have to have so that as we talk to our constituents, you know, we have some reference points as to this is what we do, this is what other communities do, this is what the schools intend to do. Um, because we just don't really have that at this point, I would say, as a general rule. We just have the assumption that we're doing the best we can given the circumstances we have. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll have, uh, why don't you add something and then I was going to sort of follow up. Um, I did want to mention another town which I thought of, which uh, what they're doing is they're uh, putting in something, that they put in like $800,000 and then they were putting in, I think, $650,000 and then each year going up by $250,000 each year is really their goal and so like when we did that interest rate we used actually a six and a half percent interest rate which gives you a sense of how much they're funding of the they're much closer to fully funding than not fully funding so and that's a fairly well-off community but more in the eastern part of uh, of Massachusetts so there are towns that are doing this I'm talking about our benefit structure not oh. the amount that we're putting in. Oh, okay. yeah. What our retirees get versus what retirees in Belchertown or Arlington or whatever get, and if that's even possible to reconsider because we don't want to mess up our collective bargaining and we don't want to mess with our employees, but the reality is we as a general rule on these elected bodies don't look at that in any detail. We just assume we're doing what the comparable is. Yeah, um, Sandy might uh, want to um, add to this uh, because my knowledge is limited. But um, what we have, and because we um, have this collective plan uh, that covers employees of Amherst Regional Schools in Pelham, is that there is an insurance advisory committee that is a fairly comprehensive committee that includes. Um, employer and employee representatives that has 
really quite successfully managed a health plan that um, is providing um, excellent benefits and um, at the same time has managed, as you know, to control premiums to the point where I think we're going into a fourth year without an, a premium increase in an era where uh, that's unusual. Uh, but I'm not engaged in that process at all. I just am aware that that board exists. Uh, I don't know if Sandy wants to add anything. There's a lot to be said for good labor relations and having cooperative relationships with your employees and your unions is uh, a very valuable thing for a community. And Andy pointed out that we've, uh, and it's I don't take credit for this as people before me, have done uh, a lot of work with our unions and our employees to make incremental changes to our plan design, to take out the, un efficient parts or inefficient parts of the plans and we don't have an indemnity plan for our active employees anymore we have more managed care plans and so forth so that we have been able to do a good job of controlling those costs it's an ongoing uh, conversation about what those benefits are and who pays for them and how you know so both in the percentage that is paid and um, the types of benefits that we offer um, so I, I do think we need to con keep looking at that. I think to do it in a way that is done as cooperatively as the town has been able to do it in the past p pays huge dividends because if you get into a situation where you're at loggerheads, that's going to cost you more than, uh, than, than trying to make incremental changes cooperatively, it's, at least in my experience. So with that, I did see so, Anurag, you want to yeah, just uh uh, and I, you know, I don't pretend that I understand much of the report that I read, but um, one question I had was um, uh, the discount rates that you were talking about, 3.5 and 7.75, how stable are those over the years? Like, for example, did you use the same discount rates last year? Or would you use the same in the two years? And how much did they change? I mean, what are they? What are, what are the drivers of those changes? Uh, basically, the uh, investment, um, the investment um, environment. But that changes year to year. Right. So you do change it, but you know, it, it is when we're making it. It's we're looking at not just one year's worth <coughs> of returns. We're really looking at over a longer term. So um, it, it's sort of you would have looked at. Uh, let's say as the beginning of the year that maybe 7.75 would be a difficult target to get it's turning out that that would that would be okay but we were looking at it from like a you know 30 you know 20 year 15 20 year sort of perspective when we but even within that that does change we uh, have used uh, typically an eight percent has probably been the most common uh, in the since I've in the 30 years I've been working on in this field uh, but you know it, it has starting to edge down okay. so it, it and it does depend as uh, about the what the Fed does too so what I think I want to do uh, because I really appreciate all of your being here and the time that you've invested in the in, uh, the, in um, learning more about OPEB so that you can um, help us and share in the discussion knowledgeably about how to address this issue going forward. Um, the Amherst Finance Committee does have other business that we'll be conducting this evening. So what we're technically doing now from the Finance Committee side is taking a five minute recess. Um, and then we will continue on with uh, just a few agenda items having to do with the town meeting warrant coming up. But we want to th I want to again thank uh, Larry for um, his participation and uh, the great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.
several months before we have to do this. All right, uh, I'm going to uh, call us back to order. Just giving Amherst Media a moment to uh, know that we're coming back together, as you know, I spoke with you just a second ago. Um, so uh, our recess has ended, and we're back to uh, agenda item three, um, which is the FY14 budget the development. But, and I don't know if we have anything further to do on the budget side of it, uh, Andy. No, just uh, just article voting on articles, I think. But in terms of uh, budget, that I do have a, an updated list of the articles with assignments and so forth. So um, it's one way to check on what we have voted on and who's speaking at town meeting on them. So I'll pass that out. And there was one I think that we uh, need to take a vote on that we. Um, just because it's not doesn't seem to be covered in minutes of prior meetings and that we just get mine and I don't think we voted on one and 13 I think are the two where we um, want to revote tonight or vote tonight because it doesn't they don't seem to be reflected in minutes they're both fairly straightforward. Maybe we should just get to them right away, um, even though then one is not a budget item, but it's uh, the reports of boards and committees, and it's one that we normally take a position on in favor of, um, in large part because the Finance Committee is one of the speakers, one of the, uh, and uh, so I think we need a motion on that. Doug? I move that we recommend approval of Article 1. I second. <laughs> okay, so the motion on Article 1 has been um, made by Kay, seconded by Bob. Any discussion? Um, Doug, I actually think you may need to move because you're not going to be in a microphone to be picked up uh, with these omnidirectional I'll, microphones. I'll, so. I'll turn it around. That's okay. Okay. Okay, so. Um, if there's no discussion, all in favor, indicate by raising hands. Okay, so it's six to zero with uh, one member absent. Um, and then um, 13 was the other one that we realized uh, we need to get a vote on, and that's our standard retirement assessment. And there was a presentation that was made. We assigned it to Doug, who um, has written it up. It's in the report, and we just need a motion on that okay move we recommend article 13 retirement assessment article 13 k has made a motion and janice has made a motion to second that we recommend article 13 any discussion all in favor indicate by raising hands so it's six to zero uh, and uh, any other, any financial news or any other things related to budget that we need to be thinking about right now? Um, I'd just say that House did pass the budget, its budget, and now it goes to the Senate. Uh, the, um, there were some minor increases in local aid, but they don't affect the town of Amherst. So the numbers that we got out of the House Ways and Means Committee that I reported to you earlier are, um, the chapter 70 and the chapter and the uh, the general local aid. Um, there is apparently some extra money for student transportation and so forth, but and that would just go to the school committee. So that's what I have to report. Okay. So then uh, the other agenda item that relates to the town meeting or the other part of it is the. Uh, non-financial and petition articles. Some we've uh, already voted on and taken positions and no positions, and some um, we have deferred on. And the question is whether there's anything at this point that we can um, take up that uh, we previously deferred I do have at least one suggestion. I don't know if uh, anyone else has other suggestions. Um, 
the one that I would um, suggest that we talk about um, because it's actually, we did something of an incomplete nature on it, which was Article 45. I think we ended up with a uh, discussion that um, was really bifurcated into several parts that um, if Article 25, in case I have this wrong, correct me, but if Article 25, which is the other social services, passes, that we do not recommend Article 45. And we said that um, if Article, so if I get, maybe you can state it. If there was an amendment to our propose to Article 25 to specify the agencies that would receive the funding, we were uh, we would uh, re not recommend that. But what we were left with was that um, if Article um, 25 were to fail, do we have a position on Article 45? I think that was where we were left with some uncertain, with a piece of uncertainty. Okay. Yep. I wrote down um, to defer it if 25 doesn't pass. So you would just, um, your thought was to just not even take it up until a, a night prior to a town meeting in between? That's what I remember too. I guess, that's yeah. what I wrote down. I think, I mean, that in some ways makes sense. Uh, the only thing we don't know, I suppose, is whether there will be a motion to take um, up Article 45 out of order. And um, it's not out of the question that that motion could be made. And um, if it is, then uh, um, it might pass because town meeting will have thought a lot about social service funding and might be in the mood to just finish social service funding. So I'm not sure that we really can assume that we'll have that opportunity. And uh, that would leave us as either having no position because we haven't had time to take one if we can have a contingent happen. position. Is that what we were, you know, we were talking about just a minute, minute ago to take a contingent position. If that passes, well, we had a. If it passes, we don't support forty-five. Yeah, but if it Idle, if Article twenty-five fails and then Article forty-five comes up, um, is a financial. I mean, at that point, we have already come out in support of on a one-time basis um, using money from free cash to support um, social service funding, but it is a different proposal, entirely different proposal. And, uh, okay. And if, if I interpreted the petitioner's um, statement properly, that is, the $90,000 in that article is assuming that CDBG money will fund the homeless shelter, that the 90000 would go to these other agencies. That's what I thought I understood her to mean. I, I, I had the same understanding. So it was essentially an additional 90000 that, That's why I was kind of surprised that we deferred in the sense that it's it's kind of outside of our budget guidelines, right? It, it mm. throws a wrench in the budget of ninety thousand uh, dollars. Well, if not, if if Article Twenty Five has failed, and we've already said that we're willing to go into free cash to fund Article Twenty Five which was, is an amount that um, we're authorizing, um, but it's in, in a, the way it's framed for town meeting, I don't think it's contingent on CDBG. Well, if we get the full uh, CDBG grant, then we don't need to spend the 90,000. 
we won't spend it, we won't spend much or any of it if we get a full CDBG grant. So it's there as a contingency if we only get the four hundred and fifty thousand dollars CDBG grant. That's how Article twenty five works. So it yeah, um Whereas okay. I think what Wei Ling's article wants to do is just spend the money no matter what. Okay. Uh, Janice and then I. So can we, um, can we vote to recommend, if, if, if we do 25 and it doesn't pass, and then we get to 45 right after, can we uh, recommend spending 90000 um, yeah, that same 90000 because it sounds like it might also be um, people wanting a different process for picking agencies. Um, so we're not really opposed to the 90000 expenditure, but I don't know. Yeah, maybe we could just limit that to $90,000 recommendation, even for that article. You know, can I clarify, because I'm sort of a, I thought I understood in one way and I'm not really sure I'm understanding it. Uh, so 25 was when John was there talking about the different scenarios of getting full funding getting or getting only $450,000. Uh, there was the scenario of $450,000 funding that there was an allocation of $90,000 for what was that for? That was for one specific thing. I think that went to the. Um, what was that? Craig's doors. Craig's well, doors. Craig's doors. Okay. And my sense was that he was concentrating on one for effectiveness. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was his choice. Instead of spreading it out, he was concentrating those ninety thousand dollars on one particular project to have some positive impact on it. My sense was. So that was Article 25. Then Article 45 is that is about those $90,000, that those should not be concentrated on one particular like issue like Craig's doors, but they should be more equitably distributed across different needs. And so our position, as I understand at that point, well, I was confused. My personal position was that that's not really something that we want to touch as a finance committee because that's the allocation decision that the manager is making and fine by us as long as the numbers match up. Uh, but I think the finance committee took a position or did a issue about meeting later on to vote on that. So, um, so that is, am I understanding it correctly on the 25 and 45? That, that's very helpful, but I, the, and, I, and I think that part's right. But the part that I thought I heard was that buried within the assumptions of Article 45 is that there's already another 90 in there from the CDBG yeah. block grant, mm -hmm. and and then there's this additional 90 which has been hypothetically proposed in Article 25 was available to spread around. To okay. The All right. Yeah. And the article itself states that this $90,000 is to go to these eight agencies. And that Craig's Doors, the homeless shelter, is not in that list. So if the worst case scenario, we don't get the CDGB money and to fund and Article 25 fails and Article 45 passes, then there's money for some agencies, but not for the homeless shelter. Yeah. So I think that the, the intent of forty-five is is actually going to shoot itself in the foot if the presumption is that the homeless shelter is already going to be funded because they're going to steal money from the homeless shelter if the CDBG money doesn't come through, and they're going to give it to the other agencies. I think that if An there was, 90, yeah, I mean, the the goal was to fund more than the homeless shelter. I think the goal is to fund the homeless shelter and four other agencies recommended by 
the uh, Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee if funds are available. Of which article are you? 25. <laughs> I wish I had that little handout from John. Yeah, I wish I did too. Um, and we may have to therefore um, once again defer this. And I think that um, if we do, the major thing we're going to have to talk about is um, the timing for meetings before town meeting sessions. I have the yeah, answers. Oh. Okay. Here. Okay, now I get it. Sorry, I was a little slow on that. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I understand it. Right. But if we get six hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand. We do say in our report that it deferred to town meeting because of that. Uncertainty after we take in our vote, but we still won't yeah. know that the CDBG money is there. Not till after town meeting's over. Right. So we're yeah, I think that that's the important element that I just heard you say, and that, that uh, an important element is that we won't know about CDBG until afterwards. There's, um, I think, two elements here. One is. Um, that it would, it's an absolute request for $90,000, regardless of the amount of money that comes in from CDBG. Uh, and if CDBG is partially funded uh, to a level, and Sandy's looking at the uh, spreadsheet now, but the principle is there that, it, that there's a level at which CDBG funds would be large enough that even if town meeting were to allocate the $90,000 that it would not be spent, which would then return it to free cash. Um, so um, there, at least there, in the way the 25 is structured, there's a possibility that it won't be spent depending upon what happens with the grant. Whereas 45 is suggesting that $90,000 be spent right regardless. Mm -hmm. And the second um, is the process question because in the one, the CDBG Advisory Committee had an open process, advertised the availability for, um, um, asked for grant, asked for grant applications, submissions of proposals, held public meetings and made a recommendation to the town manager. Um, in the other, um, there's a group that is just suggesting a list of agencies to be funded um, by town meeting. Um, and it's really, I mean, the, the, the statement was made that town meeting should make the decision but really the decision has been made in large part by the people who structured the um, petition. So um, it's, you know, it's, there, there are two elements to it. Um, one is the uh, absolute versus contingent um, allocation of the funding and the other is the process. So I think that the question is then left with all of you as to whether you feel under the circumstances that um, you want to take a position on Article 45 under the circumstance that we've, um, the 25 has failed. I move that under the circumstance that Article 25 fails, that we not recommend Article 45. Second. Well, there's been a motion that's been made and seconded. Um, I'll let you speak to the motion. Um, I, I, I think it, when we finally muddle through the issues here, you, Andy, you summarized it best. It, it's an absolute 
obligation to spend an additional 90,000 or to spend $90,000, whereas Article 25, we can approve or we have approved because it is a contingent obligation and that difference makes the difference. Absolute versus contingent. Um, yes, Janice. I think also what you said about the process of picking the um, recipients. That also would be a reason. Mm -hmm. Is there any further discussion on this motion? Hearing none, then I'm going to ask for a vote. All in favor of the motion, please indicate raising hands. So it's six to zero with one member absent. Okay. Um, are there any others that you think we can discuss tonight? I'm not sure that there are, but. Uh, I, I don't know if we took a vote on two, just getting back to two, on the transfer of unpaid bills. The position in the committee report says um, defer to town meeting, which we always do because we wait to see if there are bills, but I don't know if we actually took that vote. If you we want didn't. To take you mean to defer? Yes. At this point, what's the we likelihood? You, you, you think, think we, we did? Well, we don't really need to take a vote on Yeah, we don't have to take a vote okay, on deferring. Um, so yeah. we're just going to wait until the day, because that'll be a quick one. There will either be bills or not be bills. We either pay them or won't pay them. In, in that case, then no, I don't think there's anything else. Yes. Okay. okay. We have some articles here that don't have speakers assigned to them. Right. Um, let's hold that for a second and then come back to it because let's um, finish the town meeting position question, and then um, get to the, and then what we'll do is set a time for meeting on the first night of town meeting, and then come back and um, assign speakers um, because I think that, that you're absolutely right that we need to because speakers are also people who are going to help us to make sure that something gets written when we do the supplemental report. Um, and for a lot of these, you can do some writing um, immediately because at least the basic structure of it you can put in. Do we know, by the way, if there are any um, Planning board reports that have been issued now for once? Uh, Probably yes. Yes, in fact, if you look in the packet that I just gave you, you should have them. Okay. So, um, well, obviously, we can't do that tonight. The one thing that I just did, wanted to say is, is that the two big petition articles that relate to money is the um, North Amherst Cushman, uh, W.D. Coles, Article 43, and the Echo Hill Petition, Article 42. And um, those are complex matters that involve multiple layers um, of analysis. And um, I think we really need some help from uh, hopefully David Zomack. Um, but I know that David is still trying to work with the petitioners on those so that um, it wasn't, uh, um, he wasn't really ready to come this evening. I did send him a series of questions um, that were my questions regarding the, um, this particular pair of articles because they frame questions that I thought that we would need to deal with in order to handle an effective presentation. Things like um, how the eminent domain process is going to play out for these particular items if there is an eminent domain taking. Um, what do we know about the values? Um, and uh, are we... Um, if town, we town meeting authorizes this in the terms of the articles that are presented, does that require an action of the select board or only permit an action of the select board? Um, and uh, 
those are just samples. So what I'm going to do, because we really, uh, there's no way we can address this without um, the, uh, that kind of information. Uh, I'm going to try uh, either tomorrow or over the weekend, I will definitely send you a copy of the email that I sent um, to Jen Santi, David Zomack, and to Sandy. And uh, then I will, uh, if you have additional questions that you think need to be addressed, and we're hoping that David will come, be able to be prepared to speak to us on the night of the first session of town meeting, uh, which is, of course, May 6th. So we really need to be prepared for um, a meeting that night. And I think that it could be a meeting that is going to be a fairly substantial meeting because, well, unpaid bills might be disposed of in about 10 seconds. Uh, I'm not sure that some of the rest of these are going to be disposed of that quickly. Uh, so uh, what is possible for people? Um, I mean, usually we try and say an hour, 45 minutes, but it seems to me that this one, we might want some more time and see if we can just be done with it. Janice? Are we meeting next Thursday? Um, we haven't been planning on it. No. That would be no. <laughs> I mean, it's not impossible. I mean, we, uh, I'm not saying, not saying we can't meet next Thursday. I just don't think we planned on it. It's not, it's not scheduled right yet. It just might alleviate some of that long stuff before town meeting. Um, is anybody not available that Thursday? Next Thursday, I am not, but I am available that Monday. Could meet early. <laughs> um, let me just get a show of hands between if a choice was either meet at 5:30 on Monday and then have a real long night of it, or um, have a meeting for an extra night on Thursday if we can get everything together. Who would prefer the first option I stated of a longer day on Monday and meet at 5:30? So it's four, and I, uh, I'm, I'm Janice, I take it you. Take it you. Take it. Yeah, I could go either way, but I guess my preference would be not to have another night. Um, are you going to be in town even? Uh, I, I am in town, but I'm going to a wedding the next day, so I would rather not meet the Thursday. Um, in the end, I, I would have had to say that it would depend upon uh, only if uh, David could come. And I must say that if David says that um, he's going to have to ask us to defer the discussion until May 8, then I will not schedule the meeting as that early. I will schedule it um, at probably at 6.15 because then we would be having, breaking it into two separate meetings really. So um, I'm only going to schedule it that early if Mr. Zemeck could come. Okay, so that's the plan for that. Um, okay, Tate, let you take us back to the question you were raising about unassigned speaker. Um, yes. Um, actually, I was assigned to Tuesday night. Um, I was assigned public works, and I'm not yes. on the list. Yes, yes. I, I noticed that. But I'll get that fixed, Janice. And I think Doug wrote the transportation fund. I did. So yep. he could do that. Um, Article 7, but of course that's a no position, so we could just say we don't have a position. Um, does anybody else? No, that's all right. Um, Article 29, the Residential Rental Property Bylaw. And Article 30, Converted Dwelling. Right, but um, these are ones we've taken positions on. And the one where we might actually 
uh, I mean, 29 and 30, we could just say um, we recommend for some other reason or other. Um, so this is just for speaking in town meeting? Yes. There's already been a, written these aren't our motions, so that's just the motion to state the position of the committee uh, and to whatever is additional. So are you looking for volunteers? For, for, yes. yes. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, I'm happy to do pick up one or two more. Uh, it wouldn't be a long speech. Yeah, fine. because you're, it's basically so, what it's basically covered in the report. We try not to just repeat what's in the report, but it gives you the theme that we were on. I think it's sort of just um, stating that we supported it, uh, okay. we recommend it, and why we recommend yeah, it. Yeah, and all that information is already in this book now. Yes. At this point. Um, yes, and in your notes and minutes. And uh, the minutes be, as well, yeah. yeah. So um, sure. you're taking the residential properties? So okay, that's a pretty going to be a political one, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, may I leave after that? After I say that? <laughs> Actually, uh, the, the, the difficulty with, um, that I see with um, residential property, and I should bring this up, is that uh, we could have amendments, and we don't really have positions on amendments, and I think that when you're talking about political volatility, the basic article actually doesn't have pl much political volatility. There's a lot of support for it within town meeting to do something. Um, and I think that we've been pretty much told by the uh, neighborhood group that there are certain elements that they would amend um, and that uh, they have, I think, clearly stated at this point that it's likely to be attempted by amendment during the uh, uh, meeting itself, during the consideration of that article. And one of them has to do with um, fees and um, whether they're going to be satisfied to leave it to the discretion of the select board or going to want to specify the fees. Um, so I think we should at least be conscious of that so that we know if we're going to have a position if that were offered as an amendment. Um, another one, uh, i trying to think what, I can remember what the other two were, but um, I think I know that I have my notes from last night. Uh, but was that was one. Exempting um, owner-occupied. Yeah, exempting owner-occupied, that's right. And then those, I think parking was maybe the third. Parking plan. Okay. Um, that one is uh, Article 29. It's going to be several, at least, I would guess, two sessions before we get to that, at, at which point we may have a pretty good idea of what amendments are going to be proposed so we can meet before that town meeting and take a position on them. But meanwhile, it would be nice to have somebody ready to speak, at least to the original article. Well, Anurag has uh, volunteered to do that, and we, I think I'm, that's Am right. I doing Article 29? 29. The why why uh, I'm <coughs> trying to find our Finance Committee vote out here. Uh, I'm not really seeing it. Just keep going. It's at the end. Um, OK, so I'm um, in the zoning article on converted dwellings we took a yes position on. It's 68, 67, 68 on your own. I can do that. 66, 67. Okay, so. Uh, it's our, our, our statement is on 68. Okay, we have Slaughter. Uh, Doug has volunteered to, for Article 30 in which we have a position. And. Uh, we um, have on Article 37, which is yeah. the uh, PBTA, and I think we've taken a position on that. We need somebody to speak to that one. Um, 
PVTA funded. But I'm willing to do it, but I try not to get. Okay. Um, so Janice is on that. Um, and the rest of them, do we want to, does anybody want to volunteer to take on uh, any of the additional articles that are not yet? Andy, I would like to do 43 when we get around to it after listening to Dave, et cetera. My, my only hesitation is that I'm going to be, got that 10 day trip in the middle of all this that uh, may eclipse that, but I, I'll be prepared with some notes and an outline on that one once we've had that meeting on Monday. Okay, that's 43. So, so if you're not able to cover something, is that what you're saying? That you may be gone? For, I, can, I can back you up. You know, I, can, I can cover it up for you. Okay, so um, that's the coals. And um, so it's uh, Saul and backing up Sharma and... Um, should I put myself down for 42? Unless somebody wants it, please speak up. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll happy to do 42 once I understand it. I don't really, and I guess Dave will explain that to us also. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll put myself down as a backup to you on that one. So we have you down for the primary on both of them. Uh, I think the rest of them, 45. 45. Yes, we just finished the position on it. <laughs> I'll take it on since I'll have done, I think I've done 25 or 20, whatever the other one is, 25. So may I just, just so that I know that I don't slip on any of this, um, I'm doing 16B. You just assigned me only one right now, and one I'm just backing yeah. up Bob, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you got 16G. Oh, yeah, I got that too. And then the, uh, then the rental, the rental thing, 29, and then back up on 43. And for uh, um, so then the other ones that we'll have to be thinking about is um, any zoning ones that we take positions on, and I can't predict that we're going to take a position, so I don't want to go through assignments necessarily at this point. Bob, if we take, I'm sorry, go. yeah, go ahead, Bob. Are you doing conservation and development? I am. Okay, on this sheet has it. No. Oh. Andy really, really wants to do it. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I'm wrestle. That was a mistake. Okay. It's a typo. It's a typo. I was hoping you wouldn't notice. <laughs> uh, nice, nice try. <laughs> okay. So I think, is that it? Okay, is there? I think that's it. Okay. Um, is there anything else on non-financial and petition articles for town meeting than... Uh, any reports from liaisons from board's committees? I don't think that there are any any uh, minutes of previous meetings at this point. There are none. We've. I just want to hand this out, which is the uh, overlay declaration. Oh. Okay. okay. So this is relevant to the um, budget amendment, where we're using some of this money to. Um, fund a deficit in the 2009 uh, overlay, overlay account. deficit. 12E. Thank you. But uh, so this is just a copy of the sheet that went to um, came from the assessors. They voted the, this o these overlay amounts it totals three hundred twenty thousand dollars. We'll use forty of that for. Um, that deficit in 12E, and then the rest will just become free cash next year. Is this sheet from 1944? <laughs> <laughs> Why? 
It just looks so old school. Oh, I think it's because it's been scanned a couple of times or something. Uh, we we took positions on Article 12. Did we not? Uh, yes. I th yes. And, I don't know oh. why it doesn't say that in here. Does our, doesn't our report say that we did? Pull it out and check, but... Uh, okay, so uh, while you're checking on that, I think that we've taken care of the next meeting and the agenda of next meeting questions. So as soon as uh, we've um, checked on the Article 12 question to yep, make sure. we voted. We voted in their, their report, yeah. So I don't think there's any other business. I think we can be adjourned at uh, 920. Move we adjourn. We're we adjourned. are adjourned at 920. Amherst Media, thank you very much.